and I will leave the screen share and everything going for this just because it's all ready to sure, go. Sure, yeah. And I'll, um, I'll spotlight you for that for everyone in uh, one second. And uh, we'll, we'll start a little early, I guess, six minutes early. Why not? Is that okay for you, Anna? Yep. All right. I'm spotlighting you and let's go. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to Perspectives on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, today tackling SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation. We are thrilled to be joining Peter Graham's class happening live and in person at Concordia University's Loyola campus. I'll pass the floor to Peter so that he may introduce today's special guest, Jim Grant, in just a minute. But first, uh, just to let everyone know that we are streaming this event and coming to you live from Concordia University's fourth space located on unceded indigenous lands in downtown Jojage, Montreal. At Force Space, we facilitate daily activities that allow for knowledge sharing by focusing on what Concordia community members are working on, especially in terms of research initiatives and course activities. So speaking of courses, we are of course thrilled to have been invited into your class today to share this guest presentation across our networks. So I already mentioned that we're streaming and I'll put the link to that stream, which is on YouTube into the chat for all who are interested and want to share across your channels or refer to it after the fact. Um, and if there are any questions for Dr. Grant post presentation, we invite you, those of you in the class, obviously, you'll be able to speak and, and hopefully there's a way to kind of reformulate or slightly repeat your question so that we can hear it on Zoom since you don't have a microphone. And those of you joining us via Zoom, um, the Q&A is open for your questions there. And we'll make sure to relay them over Zoom to uh, Jim. On that note, my pleasure to pass it over to your professor, Peter Graham, to introduce your guest speaker. Hi, Peter. Hi, Anna. Thank you. Uh, so, so far in the class, we've covered uh, uh, poverty, hunger, health, education, and gender equality all issues that we address from a social science perspective. Today, we are fortunate to have the principal of uh, Loyola College with us who's a professor of biology to give us a natural science perspective on water. Uh, it's important to remember that social scientists always have to build on top of the work of, of natural science. Uh, they have to tell us uh, the sort of the ontological parameters of the, of, what, of the field that we're operating in. And sometimes, you know, the natural scientists may spend uh, a little bit too much time in the laboratory and they, and they realize that a water molecule looks like a Mickey Mouse face. So then you need a social scientist to come and tell you that that's not the best uh, metaphor to to organize your relationship with water. Sorry, we have some construction going on here that wasn't expected, but but so uh, not to be uh, not to be uh, too uh, smug about it as a social scientist. The social scientists haven't done such a great job either. Uh, because we have been using, you know, utilitarian philosophy or Kantian approaches to organize our relationship with water, and that hasn't worked out very well either. So it's always, it's always, you know, uh, better if the natural scientists and the social scientists can cooperate uh, together. And uh, Professor Grant is is really an expert in that, which is in part why he's the principal of this of the Loyola College, which is uh, interdisciplinary in, in nature. So uh, with that, I am very pleased to uh, hand things over to Professor Grant. Thanks, Peter. Great to be here with you all. And the construction noise is a bit, hopefully not too bad. I, I will warn you that I'm a fish ecologist, so I tend to think of aquatic ecosystems uh, and water, but I'm not a hydrologist. And so some of the issues uh, that we'll cover today, we really do need a hydrologist to answer. Uh, another uh, in, in the geoscience area. Let's see, maybe I will make that smaller so you can see more. So SDG6, you know what it's all about. Um, don't think I have to unmute myself, good. 
that were frozen. There we go. Okay, outline of what, what I'll try to cover. Why water's important. I always, scientists are knowing, now it's like to go back to first principles and remind ourselves why water is important. Uh, fresh water as the limiting resource, it's not all water, it's fresh water for humanity. Uh, how much of our water is fresh and accessible? And then are we using too much? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, where does all the water go, given that we're using too much? How are we gonna support the nine to 11 billion people we're gonna have on the planet in your lifetimes? Um, then I'll briefly talk about water in Canada and is access to water a human right? And I'll give you a biologist perspective, uh, which is somewhat peculiar at times, but anyways. Okay, uh, the elusive universal solvent. I remember these Renaissance alchemists uh, were, were interested in all sorts of things before they went with chemistry. They are really interested in what is universal solvent because they thought it, it could dissolve all their all their uh, cool substances and had magical properties. So you could dissolve gold and carry it around. But of course then, what I'm gonna store the universal solvent in because it'll dissolve everything. And they never did discover what it was, but of course the universal solvent was sitting right under their noses in their lab, it, it, was, it was and is water. Um, so why is water important? Well, one, it's the universal solvent. Uh, I'll call it the universal solvent of life. It's not a perfect universal solvent. It's this polar molecule, H2O. And so it's really good at dissolving ions that are polar. So salts, et cetera, dissolve incredibly well. It's not good, as you probably know, at dissolving fats and oils. Just try mixing your, your oil and vinegar dressing. Um, but more so than any other liquid, uh, water is the best uh, solvent and hence became the solvent for life. Uh, and so I'll call it the universal solvent of life. And because it is the universal solvent of all the good things we like, it also dissolves all the bad things we don't like. And that's why water is linked to sanitation. Having said that, I'll speak mainly, but sanitation is pretty straightforward, right? Um, we solved all this engineering in, in, in Southern Canada in the 60s. Um, and so this is not rocket science. It just needs investment of money. Uh, and we'll talk about problems in Canada, uh, in parts of Canada. And, we'll, and of course, the corrosive power, well, water just needs time. Um, uh, the Grand Canyon is a great example of the corrosive power of water or geological time. Okay, so what are the consequences of the universal solvent? Well, luckily, we have an aquatic heritage, but our aquatic physiology is inside our bodies and we are insulated from the world. But think a bit about aquatic organisms who have evolved in a very stable environment, particularly marine organisms, and even fresh water. Temperatures don't go up and down as much. Uh, things are much more stable. Uh, everything an organism needs is dissolved in the water, which is fantastic. But it's often only one cell width away from your bloodstream. So that's good. So if you look inside a fish, I should probably, where's my, like I see it. Oh, well, that's all right. Inside a fish's mouth, water comes in the mouth, goes over the gills, and everything is there, one cell width away. And that's, that's really fantastic, right? Uh, oxygen, nutrients, micronutrients can be regulated over the gills. The bad news is when we make toxins, new toxins or uh, natural pollutants, we elevate the concentrations. These organisms have not evolved in response to that, and that's why they're so sensitive to pollution. Okay, why water is important number two? Because it's a universal solvent of life, of course, composition of human body. 60 to 70 percent, roughly, depending on who you read at any one time. So here's a one scheme, argument 60. You'll see other books that say 70, you know, 30, 33% extracellular, 66% intracellular. So water is important, we need it. it. And it's running all our physiology in our cells and outside our cells. Uh, here's a great movie, Life of Pi. Hope you all saw this movie. Remember Pi had two main challenges. He had the tiger. What was his other challenge while on this boat? Water. Water. And what, why was that a challenge? Look at all the water around him. It's salt water, okay, yes. So why can't we drink salt water? Dehydrate, we sure wish we could. If, if our her evolutionary heritage had been different, we might be able to drink salt water, but we can't. 
And so this is the problem why fresh water is such a limiting resource because all that salt water is, is useless to us in terms of drinking unless we desalinate. So, because we can't get rid of the excess salt because we've inherited freshwater kidneys and freshwater physiology essentially from our ancestral fish. It might've been different, but that's just the way it is. And so seawater is about 3.5% salt. Our urine is less than 2%. So if we drink seawater, we're gonna be accumulating salt and we'll salt poison ourselves and we'll, we'll die. And that's why it doesn't taste good to us either. I mean, we've evolved taste buds to tell us when things are good for us and when they're bad. We can drink up to about 1.2% and be okay. Although you probably wouldn't want to drink it that uh, same line for that long. And fresh water is about a half a percent. And so that's the fundamental problem. Uh, we can't drink salt water. Other organisms can. Uh, so why do we have these freshwater kidneys, which I'm using as a short form for our freshwater physiology? Well, it just happens that we evolved from uh, fishes. All tetrapods evolve, you know, a fish came out on land as the first amphibians, which evolved into birds, mammals, reptiles, et cetera. And it just happens that that ancestral fish was freshwater or brackish water. And so brought that physiology to us. So our lung and our physiology come from this fish, which is a lungfish. This is an Australian lungfish. So this is the closest living relative to all tetrapods. If you just take any an amphibian, reptile or whatever, you, you, you uh, take its gene signature, and align it with any fish, this fish, this living fish will, will show up as the closest living ancestor. So that's why we can't drink salt water. And so why water is important. Three is just to remind us it's about fresh water, not salt. Salt water is incredibly important for other things like transportation, getting rid of our waste, which we've done all too often, but it's fresh water that we're talking about today. And here, here's good old Montreal to remind us how lucky we are. I mean, Montreal wouldn't exist except for three things. The Ottawa River coming in from the north, so water from the north, uh, the St. Lawrence from the west, and the Lachine Rapids here, which prevented us from going further upstream, so we just settled here. Um, and until we built our, the seaway, Montreal was this huge port. So it's all because of the fresh water that we're here. And look at the fresh water, the, the St. Lawrence Basin. What a remarkable place to live. So it's, I, I grew up about here uh, amidst the Great Lakes of Ontario. And these lakes are wonderful. Uh, lakes provide other values, these big bowls of water, but really they're not important for freshwater supply because it's not renewable. It's no more renewable than the St. Lawrence. So this is actually more valuable, right? Sitting on the St. Lawrence downstream, the bigger flow of water right where we are. Okay, so why is water important for? Uh, I'm not a historian, but it's always been the most important resource for humanity. We just don't think about it that way uh, because we haven't fought wars much about water. We probably have, but just think about all those civilizations you learned about uh, and I learned about in high school, I guess the last time, they've always been drawn to water. So here's a question. So I just Googled this. What's the largest city in the world not on a body of water? And even when they're on an ocean, they're usually at the mouth of a river. So it's on a river or a lake. Anyone think of what are the big cities in the world that aren't on water? To show you how important water is to us for transportation, for water supply, for pollution control, et cetera. Anyone think? I, I Google that, so I'm not. You're talking about rivers too. Yeah, rivers, yeah. Any, any thoughts? Well, it's the 64th biggest city in the world, meaning the top 63 cities, which probably have 40% of humanity or something like that. It's Johannesburg, apparently number 64. It's inland. They have great artesian wells, apparently, historically. And that's why Johannesburg uh, developed where it was. So here's an easier one. What is the largest city in Canada, not on a river or lake or ocean? It's, these are great questions. So I, I was going through, I thought it was my hometown. No, my hometown's on a river. Almost every city in Canada is on a river or a lake. Um, and so here's a hint. All the capitals are on, all the provincial capitals and our national capital are all on rivers. Uh, Kitchener, Ontario, maybe the 10th biggest, which I was surprised at. But even it, it's a bit of a stretch because you can see the Grand River, the Grand River in the background of this picture, it, it goes up and around Kitchener. So the Grand River is tremendously important to indigenous populations. There's the Six Nations of the Grand, 
Uh, but it looks like Kitchener did not develop on that river because they also have artesian wells. They have deep uh, aquifers they can take advantage of. But that's an unusual, it's unusual for Canadian city not to be on a river or lake. Okay, so SDG six is about fresh water and that's why, but we always knew that. So how much water then is on the blue planet? You know, we call ourselves the blue planet because it looks like that from space, but remarkably less than we would think. And I really like this graphic oh, first. How much fresh water? Well, 71% of the earth is blue, but it's salt water, right? Um, and it, even it is a tiny thin layer of water just clinging to the surface of the earth. Uh, so oceans make up 97% of the volume of water. Uh, here's, here's a really nice graphic I like from USGS. So here is the volume of land, the earth, and this big, blue circle here, the big sphere, is all the water on Earth, including salt water. So that's the water you have to spread over the surface of the Earth to make the oceans, uh, just to show you how little that is. And then the middle sphere, which you can barely see, that is all the fresh water. And then the tiny sphere, which maybe you can't see at all right here, that's the surface fresh water, the most valuable water to us, we call the blue water. Um, and so that's really what, that's the resource we have to deal with um, for the future. So water on earth, just summarize quickly, oceans around 97%, fresh water is three and a half percent. Okay, so this is a freshwater pie diagram now. So glaciers and ice, 69% inaccessible. It's unfortunately becoming more accessible, but that's not a good thing. Groundwater is number two, and I probably should have said more about groundwater. Um, interesting groundwater. Some is entirely renewable, some not. And we tend to treat them like lakes and just drain them down. Some of the key aquifers in the United States, for example. So it's the most valuable water are the blue lake and rivers and these tiny little percentages. So often called blue water. And then green water is soil moisture. And so that's, an, that's a tremendously important, but we can harvest it because it falls and goes into the land where it should go. So types of fresh water, just this little graphic to summarize. Groundwater is beneath the surface of the earth and it's 100% saturated. You dig a well, you can access it. But if you over, overtake, the groundwater will drop. Or if you pollute it, you'll pollute the well. And we've done that enough times. So it, it's theoretically sustainable, the question is, are we monitoring the sustainability of our aquifers? Blue water is really easy to see. It's what's in lakes, streams, wetlands. And we know the problems we're doing there. We're drying many of them out. And I'll show you some case studies. That's the most valuable and accessible water on the planet. And then green water is, so, uh, so there's the groundwater, blue water is surface. And then here is the green water in the soil, less than 100% saturated incredibly important for biodiversity and for agriculture. It's still the most important source of water, uh, but we just can't put it in a bottle, it's in the soil. And to remind ourselves of the water cycle, this is where all the water comes from, powered by the sun. So we get evaporation, we get rainfall, we get snow, we get ice. But really the key to me, if you wanted to actually sum it up, the simplest way is to go to river mouths all over the world, measure how much is hitting oceans, and that's a good estimate of our freshwater supply. It's that amount, so it's a rate per year or minute or whatever. And it's, according to these, they've rounded off, it's about 40,000 kilometers cubed per year. You'll see these estimates will vary um, because they're rough estimates. Now, of course, there's some evaporation before they hit, hit the mouth uh, of the river too, but not a bad way to estimate our water supply, our potential water supply. Questions? Just jump in if you have questions at all. Are we using too much fresh water? Well, according to the, the planetary boundary paper, the first one's by Stefan et al. No, we were in the green on this one. I think they're wrong. And even if they were correct, I think they're wrong and we'll see why. But you probably, this was in 2015 in, in science. It's one of the most important papers. Uh, they've done an update. If you remember, red is bad, yellow is worrisome, green is fine. And here's fresh water. They had us in the green area. And uh, even if that's true at a global scale, you don't measure water at a global scale. It's, is my water fresh and available? 
and is in the next watershed, do they have fresh and available water? So we don't really care about the world supply anyway. It's, it's, it's watershed by watershed. It's not like climate change. It's not CO2 in the atmosphere, which is a, you know, a world budget. So quickly, how did they calculate the planetary boundary? Well, they, they said the amount of water that can be extracted per year sustainably. So you don't take all 40,000 because you need to leave some for nature. Um, so they thought 4,000 kilometers cubed per year of blue water in lakes, rivers, and aquifers. So they've included aquifers here. So that is about 10% of the 40,000. Just so those numbers mean something, maybe 10% of the total available, they thought is what we could access in a sustainable way. And currently we're using about this. So they gave us a green uh, on water use. So are we okay? Uh, no, because of spatial variation, really it's about, uh, California is not good. The Middle East is not good. Much of Africa is not good. We are fantastic where we are, even though we have our own water problems in the St. Lawrence Valley, because we have the abundance of the St. Lawrence. And of course, are we leaving enough for nature? And so that's the other question. So th this is their graph and you can do these analyses, but the spatial resolution, you really have to uh, you know, go right deeply into this because Canada looks totally green and we know we have water problems. And so really, if you wanna look at a spatial variation, you need to do it at the watershed level and you need to be able to zoom right in to see what's, what's red, what's yellow, and what's green. Uh, it's good in some ways, it's showing no water in the Sahara, problems in the Southwest US we know of, other problems in other areas of the world. But that's even when they gave the world a green because most of the world does look green in their analysis. So, so I'd say yes, we're using too much. Here was a nice paper that was a comment in science, it's great, you publish something, somebody will comment on it if they don't like your analysis. Um, and that's the, the, the really positive thing about science. So. This is a paper came out that same year in science. And they said, good analysis, but you forgot something. You forgot evaporation from all those man-made reservoirs that we've been creating. So you went, once you add that into what's being lost, evaporation is a bad word in terms of water supply in general. Uh, and evapotranspiration transpiration from around reservoirs. So it's not only the surface, sorry, but it's the vegetation that the land will be wetter around the reservoir and you'll get extra emissions from around reservoirs. So here's their analysis and it doesn't really matter. It's just a graphical picture. So Stefan's original, here's the planetary boundary at 4,000. Stefan had us at, at all had us at around 2,600. So we were green. So they add in, the, these authors add in uh, that evaporation gets us closer with the error bar, that's, that would be yellow. Uh, and then they add in, but you, you guys didn't estimate losses because of deforestation and, you, and, and they updated some of the blue water uses already. So they have this clearly over. Um, and that doesn't really matter. Uh, I don't think it changes anything to know that we're uh, slightly under, slightly over because it's actually by area where water problems exist. And, and we have plenty of evidence of that. And I'll give you a few stories. Uh, the danger is it, it gets depressing, right? So, but we'll look at a few. So these numbers, and I forget where I took them. I forgot to write it down. You can go to the UN site. You can go to World Wildlife Fund. The numbers always vary depending on who's collecting them, but they're always about the same. Two billion people lack uh, access to safely managed drinking water. So a quarter of people on earth, you'll see that sometime as high as half. 4 billion people lack sanitation because usually drinking water comes first, then we worry about the sanitation. Um, climate change is exacerbating everything, uh, increasing the variance in our weather, so floods and droughts. So when we used to have a nice steady flow of water, now it all comes in a spate and causes us trouble rather than you know, a nice steady supply. We are incredibly spoiled here uh, on the St. Lawrence because it's all regulated for us at the Cornwall Dam. As we learned these, those past springs with the flooding, the flooding was all on the Ottawa River, not the St. Lawrence. And so we forget that our water supply is regulated because of the seaway. 80% of wastewater is untreated, which seems remarkable. And that means sewage goes raw into water because it has to go somewhere. Even if you put it on the land, it'll be in the water after the next rainfall event. 
But you know, this isn't that surprising. When I was younger, Expo 67 was in Montreal. We hosted the world in 1967. I think the stat was, we built the World's Fair in 1967. At that time, 80% of our sewers went wrong in St. Lawrence. And it was only in the last 10 to 20 years, and, and every city in Canada on oceans used to discharge their sewage raw into oceans. Like, why would you spend? Just put it in the ocean. Uh, and now I'm pretty sure Vancouver, Victoria, St. John's, I think Halifax all have sewage treatment. Um, so it, given a first world country like us, a rich country is only 20, 40 years ago, it's not surprising most of the world is discharging sewage raw into whatever body of water. And just other evidence of our mistreatment of water, 70% of natural wetlands ago are gone, including Southern Quebec, Southern Ontario, full of wetlands historically, they're all gone, many are gone. And 60% of major rivers have dams. Very few rivers flow free anymore from headwater to ocean. And by 2025, which is now four years from now, for these data, two thirds of the world's population may face water shortages. So water has always been the most valuable resource for us and will only be more important in the future, um, in my mind. Okay, so here's another, this is a countrywide spatial variation in how much water and the quality of it. Again, remember the spatial variation within countries is tremendously important, but it just shows you in general who's got good water. Well, the West does, Australia, New Zealand, and who doesn't? Much of Africa, um, South America, and big parts of Asia. And so it's not surprising we know who will have best access to water and who doesn't. And rural areas always suffer more than urban. So this is a complicated graph. What it's showing is on the x-axis, uh, percent of rural uh, uh, people who have access to good sanitation and water supply, and on the y-axis, percent of urban people. So if you look at India here, this big red dot, about 30% of people in India have access, it, it, uh, rural Indians have access to uh, good water and sanitation, well, 60% in cities. And so most of the points are above that. This is a one-to-one -one line. So most of the points are above that line showing it's always a problem for rural areas, smaller areas who can't afford the infrastructure. And we'll get back to indigenous issues in Canada um, soon. It's partly because they're rural and partly because they're indigenous, likely. So where's all the water going? Where's the water going? What do you think the big, why are we drawing down water so much? Yes. Agriculture. agriculture. Good. That's number one. And that's why water is so crucial. Eh? It's agriculture. We have to feed people. Number two. Policy. Sorry. Policy Sorry. Policy yes. Domestic. D domestic uses. Toilets, fresh water, domestic. Yes. And third. Urban. I think I have. So 70% goes for agriculture. So this is absolutely crucial. 20% uh, for industry, which is often taken water as a free resource. Ah, oh, I'm on a great lake, just use the water. Um, uh, that will be less and less easy to do. And 10% is domestic. And we've often taken that for granted as well in cities like Montreal. Uh, so we're diverting about 10,000 cubic kilometers. So that, depending on if you believe the 40,000, one quarter of all water, fresh water is diverted for our use in some way or other, uh, much for irrigation. Imagine the agriculture, it's mainly irrigation. And 30% of the average flow of all rivers and aquifers. So in this analysis, they're guessing, what is that, 33? They're, they're estimating about 30,000, um, not the 40,000. I think I have my math wrong there. Oh, something's in the chat. Am I supposed to be watching the chat? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. And one quarter of all rivers run dry before reaching the ocean. Now that's a pretty, I didn't believe that statistic. And I actually went and the paper that cited it, cited another paper and I couldn't, that paper wasn't accessible. So take that with a grain of salt, but still I'll show you some of the major rivers in the world that run dry. And it's pretty, I, I couldn't believe that. 
Um, and only 30, I said 60% are dammed, 37% run freely uh, from now. The one good news in the US in particular, they're starting to remove dams uh, to recreate ecosystem, to restore rivers to the original function. So they're ahead of us and that probably because their dams are older than ours. And as they have to recommission their dams, sometimes they're just saying, you know, let's take them down. And so the US, I think in Europe are leading, leading the way on taking dams down. And climate change increases evaporation, of course. And so we're gonna fight against evaporation. Evaporation is the big negative for humans. Uh, our water use is of course increasing over time. So here are three graphs. Remember the project that's projecting into the future. Fresh water withdrawals, of course, up, mainly for agriculture. Uh, we can see irrigation, tracking that really nicely. And human share of primary production on land. It's remarkable that we are now taking around 25% of all the photosynthesis on the planet is for us, um, either eating directly or feeding it to our animals and then we eat them. So that's a pretty uh, astounding, you know, all the wild uh, forests and ecosystems are only using 75%. Okay, rivers that run dry. The Colorado, we all know, the, anybody, other rivers, do you know that run dry? Isn't this amazing that a river actually would run dry? Um, now this is a dry, but it didn't historically run dry. The, the Yellow River in China, see, these are some of the major rivers of the world. The Nile runs dry, uh, partly because it's dammed and they want it to run dry in some ways. Uh, the Indus in Pakistan, the Amu Darya, which I don't know much about. The Murray, the, the biggest river in Australia, or one of the big ones in Australia. The Jordan, not a huge river, but you know, of biblical importance, I guess, you know, from the Middle East. So. Some of the major rivers of our civilizations now kind of run uh, dry or get close to running dry, uh, which is a pretty frightening thought. You, you've all know the Aral Sea example. This is kind of the poster example of water mismanagement. So here's a picture of 1989 and 2014. It was formerly in 1989, the fourth largest lake in the world at about 68,000 kilometers squared. So it's hard to put that into context, which means it's bigger than our Lake Huron. So Lake Superior, our biggest lake, we share both of these with the US, is bigger than this, but this is bigger than Lake Huron. This is a big lake. It'll feel like an ocean. Um, but it's dried up because water diverted by irrigation by the Soviets and now the Russians. Um, and so water diversions for agriculture. It's recovering a tiny bit now. It may back, be back to 10%. This is the bottoming out, and I'll show you. Uh, here is some pictures of what it bottomed out, maybe 2004. It's just coming back a little bit, this northern basin, which is deep. They're trying to recover this a bit and recover fish populations. So it's about what's important. Uh, somebody upstream wanting water for agriculture or this lake, and the people who used to fish this lake and, and the ecosystem services from the lake, so. And the mighty Colorado, this river that carved the Grand Canyon, um, I've never been there. People, I guess, go rafting down it, but they don't raft at the bottom, they raft in the upstream parts where there is water. Um, it's not reached to sea apparently since 1998 um, because of all the use of water on this river. Over 40 million Americans are, are, need this water, more than 100 dams, diversions, et cetera. Irrigation takes 78% of it. Remember, they're also tapping the groundwater in these areas, but this is the easy water, it's surface water. Uh, and, and the key is it come, it rises in the mountains from glaciers and snow, flows all the way down to Colorado. Uh, oh, and it meets the ocean in Mexico. So one cynical American said, I, I will bet you if, if the Colorado had met the sea, oops, in San Diego, um, it wouldn't run dry, but it was going to meet the sea in Mexico. So what's the, the American, let's take the water for our agriculture and for our use. Uh, it's probably true, I don't know. And that's what it looks like in some of some years in the lower reaches. I know I'm going back. Questions? Just, just jump in if you have questions at all, but. Yes. Things are remarkably resilient. You know, for a while we thought uh, ecosystems are 
and, and biological communities are always changing anyways, you put the water back, things will come back. It may take a while and you might not recover your whole community. So the Elwha River, I think it's in Oregon, um, on major salmon river, they took the dam down and the salmon are now running back up there. They just found the river and the natural processes, it's all physics. The water flows, carves the river valley back, things return. Um, I think river is incredibly resilient. And if you let the water flow, things will come back. You might not get your endangered species back right away, but you'll get a lot of your ecosystem function back. And of course, the pleasure of seeing that river. Uh, so it's one of the easiest things to do is to start, you know, and, and that's what the Americans are trying to do in some areas. Not here, this water is too valuable as judged by some. So agriculture, you haven't had SDG2 yet, right? Agriculture? That, that'll be coming later, right? sustainable agriculture. So hopefully, I, I was hoping you'd had, but I'll talk just about the water part of it, not the agriculture. So why is water so crucial? Well, the equation for photosynthesis, if you remember, it's carbon dioxide plus water. That's it, gives you glucose and oxygen. So you need water. It's the hydrogen donor, you'd say, in, to make the carbohydrate. And that's what plants, that's the magic of photosynthesis, the magic of plants. And so water is fundamental to that process. And the number two reason is transpiration. Plants are sedentary. Uh, and so rule of thumb is if the plant have a crown of leaves this big, they have a crown of roots of the same size. And how do they get stuff? How do they acquire nutrients and water? Well, through their roots and through the mycorrhizal fungi that are attached to the roots. So they transpire water out their leaves and draw water up through the roots. And that's how they get water and nutrients. They use the water and that uh, hydrostatic power to draw things out of the soil. So it's incredibly important for plants. And so if you look at kind of a, a picture of what's going on, uh, waterfalls on the land, runoff is fine. That's our blue water, it goes to streams and rivers and lakes. Um, it can recharge our aquifers in, in terms of groundwater. It can be used for transpiration, which is good. Uh, evaporate, natural evaporation is fine. It's part of the water cycle, but it's enhanced evaporation by climate change, by how we till the land. This is one we like to st stop because that's water that we don't get a crack at before it's back in the atmosphere. And so if we increase evaporation, plants don't get anything out of it. And it's lost to us. It'll come back to us in rain, but we're losing that fragment, that part of the fresh water. So types of water needed for agriculture, green water is the biggest part. And that's the encouraging part. Agriculture still, it's just based on rainfall, moisture in the soil. No irrigation is required. Um, and then there's blue, the blue water is irrigation. And so even though green water is the biggest part, it's this, the blue water is the threat to our water supplies because it's where most of our water goes. And then there's the gray water. Well, if you're putting fertilizers and uh, pesticides on your fields, you need water to wash those away. And that is originally rainwater or blue water, but it's called gray water because it needs, you need water to dissolve the waste. Just like in our domestic sewage systems, we got a lot of gray water to get rid of our sewage and all the, the our water uses. And so gray water could be formerly blue or green, but it's polluted now and, and we're not gonna call it blue anymore because we can't do anything with, with it without a lot of use, a lot of transformation. So those are the uses. So having said, green water is the most important, but we won't talk about that because we don't manage that, that's climate but we do manage the blue and the gray. And th those are the cr crucial ones. What am I doing? Am I okay? So sustainable agriculture, that's SDG too. So I'm not gonna intrigue too much in that, but I'll just talk about the water side of it. So how much water do we need? Well, depends on who's doing the estimates. Some people think a thousand to 2000 uh, meters cubed per person per year. Uh, I think that's right from the UN site. Um, so if that's true, you can just do the math, right? Uh, 26 countries around the world don't have that amount of water. The challenge is to produce more food with less water. That will be the challenge because we're already over budget now and we're gonna have 2 billion more people by the end of the century, probably. So minimize uh, 
evaporation and optimized transpiration, the use of the water by plants. And uh, we don't want evaporation in our irrigation, that's for sure. So if we have only 4,000 kilometers cubed available, that's Stefan, you can do the math, divide by, that means we can support two to four billion people. Hmm, that's not good, is it? So somebody's math isn't jiving, but it's because people have different assumptions. Some people think we have 12,000 available. That would mean six to 12, but you can see we're already close. If it's six, we're at eight almost, and we're gonna be very close to this. Besides, it's not the, the world budget again, it's the local budget that's important because of the spatial variation, rainfall, and water supply. So the real challenge for SDG2, sustainable agriculture, is how are you gonna produce more food to feed the world and you not bankrupt our ecosystems and our farm fields? That is the real challenge. So any thoughts? How are we gonna do this? Yes. Like not growing food on mountains. Not growing food on mountains, okay. Leave them alone, okay. But that's a small part. We don't grow a whole lot. We probably do some grazing up mountains, but uh, but sure. Other thoughts? How do we make agriculture more? And there'll be also the same answer for carbon, but we're going to focus on water here uh, because water is going to be the one that's going to kill us in agriculture. Carbon will get us through everything else. How do we make agriculture more sustainable? Yes. By recycling water already? Sure, getting way more efficient using gray water. I mean, we don't do much with gray water at all, right? It just goes into the Lac Saint Louis and back into the St. Lawrence. But if it was valuable to us, we'd be using that gray water to water our gardens, et cetera, et cetera. So we, yes, all sorts of that. Anything else? This is a really suggestion. I guess it's a question, but what maybe what you're going to Food, ah. Um, use ah. like, good point. What do you think? So you couldn't hear what kind of food? Guess what is the worst in terms of uh, your, yes. So it our diet is number one, and our diet is we're going to need to change our diets for the climate crisis, and it will also help with the water crisis. The and so eat a less water intensive diet. Exactly right, and so. I'll show you some of the, um, of course, the steak on the left is a much higher water put, footprint than um, the plate on the right. But what I'm gonna show you is not the total water budget. You, depends on what you ask for. If you look at the water budget for beef, they'll give you the green and blue and gray. But what we really care about is the blue and the gray because that's what we control and that's what's limiting. So I'm gonna show you the blue and the gray water budgets. Um, so you'll see numbers that are higher because remember green water is still the most valuable just turns out that uh, from if you're eating grass fed beef they're raising those cattle on they don't irrigate rangelands right and so it's all it's mainly green water but if you're eating corn fed beef it's the irrigation of the corn uh, that is causing the problem so i'll just show you some water footprints of common foods blue and gray behind my thing there I can start with, we don't eat cotton, I know, but it's the highest. So if you're wearing blue jeans today, make sure they last 10 years. Um, and if they do, that's probably not a bad investment um, or might not be. My jeans just seem to last forever. And then hence, you know what, they, they go out of style, but they always come back in style. So just keep them, they'll be in style later. Uh, so if you go through the, the foods, this is uh, liters per kilogram. It's only blue and, blue and, and uh, green, uh, sorry, blue and gray. So you will see higher numbers if you include the gray, uh, the green water. Chicken, all the usual stuff. Rice, why is rice so high? Any thoughts? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's irrigation in the gray water. So it's, a, it's, a, it's grown in wet climates, but if it's not in a wet climate, you're irrigating the heck out of your field. Uh, and so that's why. So here's one with a huge water footprint, a bigger one than I would have guessed, but it makes sense. Eggs, lamb, just a cost is pretty high because we irrigate wheat, I guess, in many parts of the world. Uh, wheat, bread, same, cheese, corn, beer is relatively low. Beer and wine, there we go. You don't feel so bad. Um, apples, wine, you know, I wish I had more vegetable. This site was not giving a whole lot. Potatoes are low. 
Um, so if you look at the carbon footprint of the, I think it's a little flatter than the carbon footprint, but it, it's about the same. I guess it's about a 10 to one beef to potatoes. So, uh, so there is a water footprint and a carbon footprint. And so, yeah, less intensive. So, so just eating less red meat is gonna help for everything. Um, land, water, carbon. Doesn't mean you can't eat it, just eat less. I'd say abstinence isn't required, just less. So th this figure is not terribly important, but I want to show you two things. There's some data for uh, farms in India. And on the top is the water requirement and the bo bottom is the economic return. So maybe these are things that farmers would pay attention to if, if water was paid for or something. So here's bananas, uh, huge water requirement, not very valuable uh, versus tomatoes, small water requirement, big value. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should switch to tomatoes, just saying, depending on how your agriculture works, if in California, maybe you should be paying for your water. These are big farms, right? Then maybe they already do pay for their water. I don't know. But some of the considerations you might take into account when you're planning your farming, optimize, as someone said, optimizing use of water. And we certainly need more sustainable practices, because if you get used to an abundance of water, you waste it. So I said 70% before, every site will be slightly different. 70% uh, of blue water withdrawals are for irrigation. So remember all those lakes and streams, it's irrigation. Um, and most returns to the atmosphere by evapotranspiration. Now, I don't mind transpiration if it's your crop that you're trying to grow. Evaporation, no. And you don't want increased transpiration because of the way you're tilling your land. So if you keep tilling it all the time, you're gonna have lots of ev evaporation. And this draws down groundwater supplies too, because we're then drawing on the groundwater. Less water available for gray. So the, this is the, the problem. Um, and it, we need to be just more efficient and more clever with the use of water. Um, nitrate pollution, because that's, that, that means there's not enough blue water uh, so the gray water is, is getting more and more polluted. And so you can't even use it. It's a loss to your water system and might be going into your groundwater. And then you can't even use the groundwater supplies in your well. Um, so solutions, uh, how to make um, irrigation more sustainable. Well, we could think about, we've been doing this forever and hence these pictures will be from more from the developing world as so-called developing world harvesting rain during rain harvesting water during rains we've always done this and this is getting more challenging with climate change if there are now if now the monsoons are even worse than they used to be now it's you just worry about flooding and people cities being washed away but if you can harvest water during the high water season when it's just going to flow down uh, to meet the sea, then you can use it later for agriculture. And of course, the Nile Delta always did this. Every Delta took, took advantage of natural flooding, flooding in their agriculture. Um, so these are ways to use water a bit more wisely. Uh, urban agriculture. Uh, and Montreal is a real city for urban agriculture. I think there's a real future in small scale, intensive agriculture, meaning a lot of workers per output, meaning each of us has our own garden um, because way more efficient on everything, fertilizer, water, productivity is high. Um, so it's labor intensive. Uh, th 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 this is from African data. Urban agriculture can use five to 20% of the water, much less land as opposed to a farm with tractors and tillage. Um, so I think we have to just rethink and there are examples around the world. Of course, we farm like this forever. It's just, we don't do it in an industrial farming capacity. Uh, here's the Botswana data. Uh, container farming out of small little containers could produce 20 tons per hectare of food compared to maybe 10 tons, these are just raw numbers. So essentially you can get high yields is, is the main thing. I think the highest yields have always been in small farms. Uh, so you, we should rethink what is efficient farming. Uh, North America is probably the most efficient if you measure it one way. How is our agriculture really efficient and, and inefficient? Okay, so that means that none of us farm anymore, right? You, you can go back, if, you, if your family's been in Canada for a while, you can go back generations to know when, oh, 
they were farmers, they were farmers, they were farmers. Um, nobody farms anymore. So we're really good at yields per farmer because we've got these big combines and tractors or air conditioned, we have fertilizer, we pour oil onto the land and the turn, which is what fertilizer is. And so we're really inefficient for water, for carbon, for oil, for everything, but we're really efficient at yield per farmer. So that's clearly not the way to go in the future. Uh, we can't do this. We have to think more about efficiency in different ways. So more sustainable farming, I think you want to maximize yields for water, for carbon, for hectare, for whatever is locally important. And I really think small scale urban um, might be a, a real way to boost productivity. And cities haven't been producing that much in the past, and yet we have lots of land oh, somewhere. So these more intensive, smaller farms, more workers are involved in farming uh, in a casual way or part-time way. Um, these are ways to make it more sustainable. SDG2 person, hopefully we'll talk about agriculture. Uh, but just in terms of irrigation, this is not the way to irrigate on the left. You don't want to create channels where you just send water for hundreds of kilometers and lose more in evaporation. You lose a ton in evaporation and then you spray it onto the fields. And, you know, most of the water is lost before it's absorbed into the soil. So that's just waste. It's essentially just shooting it off into the air. Uh, evaporation is our enemy here. Um, you want other things. So this is a high-tech version, uh, drip irrigation. So you drip it right into the soil and you keep it within pipes. It's way more expensive, but the investment, you know, water is worth more than anything. Uh, it will be the most valuable thing for us. It's more valuable than oil, of course. Um, and you can do it in low-tech ways too, um, especially if it's powered. Hand watering, and that's why small scale, whenever you deliver the water yourself to where you need it, when you need it, that's always the most efficient. Um, so small scale agriculture doesn't have to be just hand, but it can be you know, much more local control of the water rather than giant fields on average giving you the right amount of water. Uh, paper use, uh, never popular taxes on things. Uh, hopefully they're designed to be revenue neutral. I don't know if that's possible. Peter's the economist will tell us the problems with this. Uh, this is clearly for wealthy countries. Um, who lives in Montreal? Do you pay for your water? Do you actually pay? We live in Point Claire. We pay for it. I don't think in Montreal you do. I don't think you're metered. So maybe you pay a flat tax. No, we pay a hydro bill, but there is. That's your high, that's your electricity. Yeah, that's not water, like heating yeah. water. You're not paying for your water. Yes, yeah, so Point Claire, we have our own water. We, we are metered, we pay. Well, maybe you do, yeah. Uh, but just look at your bill. You'll, you'll know if you have a water meter. On your house, a water meter that runs? Oh, that's your electricity. You, no, sorry, that's your electricity. You have your water meter down by your intake mm -hmm. and it turns over. So. Anyways, some analysis have been found. If you meter it, you save water. I mean, we use way more water than Europe does. I mean, there's, they have a great quality of life, so do we. How can we just waste their water? I think there's lots we can learn. Um, it encountered the tragedy of the commons, which is water. Water is a classic uh, tragedy of the commons. And maybe major water users, like industrial water users, these are solutions. Make them make you more efficient. Uh, now we need that water for, you know, fresh water supply for, for tap water, et cetera. Okay, what country has the most fresh water on earth? Canada. No, we don't. <laughs> we're for, we're pretty good, but we're not for, we tend to think we have, we have the most surface area of water, we have the most coastline, but we don't have that much rainfall. So we're about number four. Um, and a lot of, I mean, think of all the, the Arctic, some would say, oh, we're wasting all that water going into the north where nobody lives. Well, sorry, that's where it goes. So, uh, but we certainly have the most per capita. We are water wealthy per capita. Small country, uh, small population, big land, lots of water. So, but doesn't mean we don't have problems. There are at least two major water issues in Canada. Can you think of some? Snow leading to? 
Yes, it's shoveling. Yeah, it's a pain. Winter is a pain, isn't it? <laughs> but are there water supply issues in Canada? Indigenous one is uh, Indigenous one is, I mean, what a, how, how shameful, eh? Uh, so Indigenous and our glacier-fed rivers, you know, we live in the east and on these wonderful big rivers fed by rainfall and lakes, which kind of even out the flow. All our Western big cities, which are suffering droughts and also forest fires are fed by glacier fed rivers. And this is a problem. So we'll do that one and then we'll do the indigenous. So here's a really cool paper in nature and I'll talk very briefly about it. They're called water towers, meaning glaciers in mountains. These towers of water that support much of humanity through glacier fed rivers. Question, no? No. no. And so they identify these ones in North America. You see the ones in North America? We're going to talk about the Saskatchewan Nelson. We'll, I'll show you the Fraser. And the Columbia, of course, the Columbia should be in the US, but we diverted, well, we diverted everything in the Columbia. Uh, it's in part Canada and the US because the Columbia River Project, which is a disaster, I think. So uh, 78 rivers threatened around the world because of climate change. So if you don't get, first, the glaciers melt. And if more and more uh, precipitation falls as rain, not snow, it means it runs off and you get a flood event. And so your hydrograph looks like big spring flood, nothing in the summer. Um, and go ask somebody in the prairies whether they're like that or not. The glaciers melted nice and slowly and gave stable flows over the summer, which is beautiful. Uh, but so climate change is a real problem here. Melting of the glaciers uh, reduces flow when you really need it in low water in July and August. It's, it's a problem. The mighty Fraser going by Vancouver, but I won't talk about that now. I'll talk about the Saskatchewan, which, so headwaters of the Rockies here, all these glaciers, I can't get my finger work, but you can see the headwaters of the Rockies. Look at all the major cities of the prairies are on these rivers. Edmonton, Calgary, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Saskatoon. They rely on glacier, the glacier fed Saskatchewan River. Um, and these, these, these cities will have water problems. They're gonna have developing water problems. And they're also the prairies, which is dry. Droughts are going to get worse because of climate change anyways. And now you add on the water shortage issues. So this will be a challenge for big parts of Canada. Yes? Doesn't China rely on the glaciers in the Himalayas? I mean, isn't that gonna be a- Yes, it's, it's uh, absolutely. The question is about China. And of course, everything coming out of the Himalayas, Himalayas or whatever, those major rivers are all glacier fed. And so as climate, and China always has problems in its major rivers, um, including the yellow. Uh, what's the three gorges is on Yangtze, I guess. Yeah. So, and they are, you know, they're at least they're regulating their own water for agriculture, but it's gonna be a challenge for China. They've gotten through their famine problems of the seventies and eighties, but, Climate change, all you need is a little tipping points and things will change. Um, so if you ever go to the, there's a great glacier site uh, between Lake Louise and Jasper where they show how the glaciers receded. I mean, they are receding since the last glaciation, but you can see the acceleration because they put a little marker every, first it was every decade. And now it's like every year, you can see how much it's going back. It's, it's kind of frightening. So, you know, these solutions are not easy. It's called fight climate change because you can't do anything about it. It's a world problem. There's no local solution to that except adapting, getting more efficient water conservation. Um, those are, those would be the issues on the prairies. Don't waste water anymore. Maybe you're not gonna water grass anymore. Water quality around the world. I mean, uh, this is a fake, we look number two, we're actually ninth out of 157. Uh, and, I didn't read the original paper, but I think it's probably because of our rural problems, indigenous and rural. But so the indigenous are rural and they're indigenous. So they have, you know, these problems with the Indian Act, et cetera. So let's talk about indigenous people and fresh water in Canada because it's kind of shameful. So what do you know about indigenous uh, water issues? Came up in the last election. What did Trudeau promise? and got hammered rightfully so, not that the other parties would have done any better, but so they, they have all these 
they're long-term boil water advisory. So in, a, in 2015, 105 indigenous communities had long-term water problems. So you can't drink the water. Some people have been living all their lives with no fresh water um, because they can't drink it. So it's bottled in or you boil it or something. Um, so Trudeau, he promised, he pledged, in five years I'll solve this. To his credit, it is getting better, but he did promise it. Um, and, you know, given everything else, uh, our treatment of indigenous people, that was one he could have done. That's way easier than solving some of the other problems, I think. 58 have been added since, since, but 101 have been lifted. So there is some progress, but with 58 new ones crop up. Uh, and this is according to the government website. Maybe indigenous communities wouldn't agree with those numbers. Um, so 58 or so advisors remain. They are going down steadily. But um, that's March. I think the, the numbers are down as of today, maybe down to 30 or so. So we're making progress, but um, they're showing just Ontario was the worst. Um, the water advisors were just increasing, increasing, and then Trudeau took over over here. So there we are. We are making progress, but look at the number of communities that still don't have access to fresh water in Canada. And so it's so embarrassing, right? So we have our political fights with China. They love to point this out. Um, or Europeans can't believe that people in Canada don't have access to fresh water. Um, it, it's embarrassing. It's, so, um, And I think the water advisories are the tip of the iceberg. That is just, these ones go critical, right? 73% um, of First Nations water supplies uh, are higher medium risk, meaning they're okay now, well, there's the bad ones. And then the other ones could go on an advisory any day now. What's the latest? It just went in an advisory like yesterday or today. Did you hear about it? Gasoline in what place? A, a capital, Ikawi. So, you know, Ikawi, a capital, one of our territories, um, they, they're on a big boil water, well, not boil water, because there's gasoline in the water. Don't drink the water at all. I guess they're they're trucking water in as they try to figure out what, because it's an aging infrastructure. Um, this is not rocket science. This is simple engineering. Um, most of the engineering companies in Canada made their money on, on make building sewage treatment. It's really easy and you can do it on a small scale. It's more expensive, of course. So the solutions are just spend some money and give them control of the water supply. Uh, some obvious things. Okay, I should. Are we leaving enough water for nature? I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, the answer is going to be no. Of course, there are, there are more than 140,000 species living in that tiny surface area of fresh water, which means this is one of the richest areas for biodiversity. It rivals rainforests and coral reefs. Uh, and yet, just look at all the rivers. Drive through the US, through the Corn Belt, look at rivers in the US. We'll feel a little better about our own, but, anyways. Um, I showed you a graph at the left, that's the drawn water. On the right is just the decrease in biodiversity. Um, and I won't, wetlands going down, freshwater, uh, uh, land is going down for all sorts of uh, biodiversity. I won't belabor the point. So most would say, no, we're drying the water and we're endangering natural ecosystems, which we also draw wealth from. Most of our wealth comes from nature. And I'll, let me just end on this. Uh, should water be a human right? And I have to admit, I've struggled with this one as a fish ecologist because fish need water. Uh, are humans more important than fish? Um, I don't know. So obviously all humans need access and should have access to, to fresh water. That's, that's a no brainer. But I would say the answer to this question is no, from my point, if it means we're putting ourselves above nature and all the other million or 10 million species. So, because it, it's a selfish, it's a selfish to protect the other 10 million species. Right, they benefit us. Um, it's yes if we if we say yes. Human, it's a, it, it's both a human right and a natural right uh, that ecosystems have access to water, and so we don't draw water down like the Arrow Sea. That just should be criminal. That should not be allowed, and should be uh, should go to the, the court. Uh, and there is this growing trend now, the lakes and rivers should have the same rights as humans. Of course, it's a growing trend in the West. Uh, and it's always been the trend in indigenous communities. They name, they can name them. They can, they don't call them it. They think they're alive. And so 
if you haven't read this book, this is a fabulous book. book. Uh, had a huge influence on me. She's so interesting because she's a trained botanist scientist, but she's indigenous. So she talks two eyed seeing, she, she talks both ways. But I, I love what she says about indigenous thoughts on things like water. Among our Potawatomi people, women are the keepers of water. We carry the sacred water, it's sacred, the ceremonies enact on its behalf. Women have a natural bond with water because we are both life bearers, my sister said to her. We carry our babies in internal ponds and they come forth in the world in a wave of water. It is our responsibility to safeguard water for all our relations. Our relations means other species. Um, and so it's for all species. In indigenous philosophy, what little I know, humans aren't up here and everything else here. It's, if anything, humans are thought of as being new on the planet and have to learn from nature. So any questions about that? I know that probably went way too fast, but uh, summary, water is the universal solvent of life. Fresh water, crucial for humans, always has been. Rare on the planet, we're using too much. And even if we're not, locally we're using too much. So we need to be more efficient. Agriculture is gonna be the key because we have to feed people in a sustainable way without ruining the planet. Um, we have all this water in Canada and yet we have problems. <laughs> Two big problems that we need to deal with. And then think about water as a human or natural. Water. So that's it. Thank you, Peter. Other questions? We all started off. Los Angeles is a city, you know, when they built the city, they built this huge uh, stormwater infrastructure to get rid of whatever it rains. And now I saw in the news last night they're going to build a big plant so, so that they can take their wastewater and recycle it into drinking water. Cool. I mean, how much do you think uh, our problems are are about just fixing the mistakes of the past? Ab absolutely, and of course, so Montreal. What is it? Fifty percent of our water gets lost in our pipes. Isn't that ridiculous? And yet we are paying, and the water. I water my lawn, it's chlorinated and treated. Uh, so we really need two streams, gray water and blue water, uh, or drinking water and gray water, or we use our blue water twice. First for us, for our bath and whatever, we like it to be clean. <laughs> we like to drink it clean, but then use it for gardening, whatever. Yeah, so we'll be probably the last to do it because we're living on this great river. Um, but we should surely replace, and we are slowly replacing those pipes that keep leaking. And causing all the slumps, you know, you know, they see, you know, the, the roads go in. But LA and these cities like this in the Middle East, Israel is probably one of the most water efficient nations. Um, yes, I think it's pretty simple technology. This is rocket science. It's simple engineering. It's spending the money and thinking about uh, how to deal with water. So in cities, we have where are all the rivers on the island of Montreal? They're buried. So all we do with water is in a city, we it's just a, 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 it's a pain. So we bury it all and then we get a big rainfall event. It hits the hard pavement, floods into the carry and all other low spots. You know, we need more green space to absorb the water, to transpire it back, to even out the flow and help us with these problems. So, so I think it's just designing cities. It's, they're all designed for cars in North America and hence they're designed poorly. But I think we retool and build smarter. And LA has to, because their water's short. California, you shouldn't move to California. I mean, they have no water. I don't know why anybody would want to move to California uh, and they have fire. Um, so water shortage and fire just seems to be the future of that state, I would think. Great beaches, but... Any other questions or thoughts? I should see if there's anything. I didn't talk much about groundwater. Uh, the good news is, and I should have done more on it, um, there is real potential in Africa. So you often see these development ads, dig a well in Africa. Some of that is true. They have probably, some countries have untapped groundwater which could be really sustainably used for local agriculture but don't follow the north american model right of shipping it all over 
local, irrigate locally, efficiently, whatever. And so there was a nice graph. I should have brought it up. I mean, there is untapped um, groundwater. The trick with groundwater is, you know, a river you can see when you're using too much, it goes dry. And even then we run them dry. So the problem with groundwater is it, if you treat it like a lake, you'll just run it down. And we're doing that. What's the Ogallala Reservoir? This big aquifer in central, the Corn Belt one, it's run way down in the US because they're irrigating, because they don't have big rivers, or some don't. And so they're irrigating from wells and groundwater. Uh, and so it's much harder to monitor, but there are sources that can be tapped. And then about 30% of freshwater was ground. So there is some, uh, particularly in Africa, which always shows up as the worst for water supply. I think some people are feeling a little more optimistic about sustainably harvesting groundwater in a local way. You could do wonders, but you just have to be careful to monitor. And you don't want to, once you pollute the groundwater, you just, you know, how long will it take to re, for, for that groundwater to clear out from rain? And so you could have, it's like polluting a lake for a long time. There's, there's also often a problem of salinization when you're using groundwater for irrigation. So yeah, great point. Sure, because if there's so much evaporation from, from irrigation, and if there's even small concentrations of salts in the groundwater, it fills up in the, in the land. So groundwater is going to be solid water? So groundwater be solid water? Not it's fresh the way we talk about it. So yeah, it's always fresh water. There's likely salt, marine groundwater as well, but we're talking about only fresh water. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what about desalination? Can't we just desalinate the ocean, make all the fresh water we need? Is that an option? <laughs> sure, great. Let's think about the ocean. And it's energy intensive. You better not be burning oil to do that. You've lost on both fronts, right? I think in the Middle East, they are maybe doing with solar. solar yeah. So if you use solar to do it, but you gotta be careful, it's expensive. And, but I think Israel and the mid, other Middle East countries are very water conscious. And so they are certainly um, using ocean water, taking New York City, the famous example about 20 years ago, their water supply was shot. They had two approaches build desalination plants, which we've been using fossil fuels then, so aren't they glad they didn't do it, or protect their upstream forests way up in, in you know, upstate New York, which they did because all their water comes down. It flows that way anyways, but the, the watershed does, but that they pipe water from these upland, upstate um, res reservoirs from Manhattan. And so water is incredibly valuable uh, for big cities even though they're on, they're on smallish rivers. They're not on a huge river. Great, okay, thank you very much. What do we do here? Do we, sh do we shut this off? I'll let you do it. Do okay. You, you know the technology better than I do. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Grant. Um, and Anna, I think we're, we're ready to wrap it up here. All right, sounds good. Uh... Okay. Well, in that case, I will just uh, thank you as well, Jim. That was really wonderful for us to be able to listen to and witness. And it's been a real uh, treat, uh, I think, for us at Force Space also to see you present because we always see you in, a, in another capacity. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so folks, we'll, we'll go ahead and close up uh, the webinar now and enjoy the rest of your course. We'll see you again, I believe, uh, next week. And on that note, have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your class. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.